This is Clarence. He is one year old today. These are his friends. Like all babies, they were born with 100 billion neurons, nearly twice as many as an adult, even though their brains are half, half the size. Their brains are going faster than any other part of their bodies. 60% of their metabolism is being spent on growing their brains. By three, their brain volume will have doubled. But those 100 billion neurons will not stay forever. As the children move, play, and learn, these neurons are being connected into circuits. Circuits that govern emotions, motor skills, and speech. The circuits that are used get reinforced. The circuits that are neglected get pruned away. What remains is a basic structure that will influence the rest of their life. It is how they will see the world. It will influence their thinking, feelings, their joys and fears. Most of how the world will see, how they will fit, what they will do, will come from this brain. So if you want to change the world for the future, build the frame. Focus on these first three years. And in the first three years, parents make the difference. We are so excited to introduce everyone to Dr. Tom Insel. He is one of my heroes. I, I years ago when I had a child in battling serious mental illness, and I was frustrated with the system and frustrated that I was not able to be included in some of the, the therapy and, and be taught how I could help my child. Uh, my sister sent me an article by Dr. Tom Insel, and I read it. And I called my sister up. I said, how did you get this? And she said, I don't know. I just happened to have it. So then I looked up everything he, he had written and I started to read him. And I just grew with great respect for this man who spoke up about what needs to happen and who is a, a visionary and someone who wants to make life better, not just for himself and just his family, just his community, but for the nation, if not the world. And I also really appreciate that this Dr. Insel when a, a totally unknown person who's making a documentary reaches out to him and said, hey, can I interview you? That he says, sure. And then when we interview, just to feel his warmth, his commitment to truly trying to change the world and who would at the end say, let's just, let me give you a hug as we left. He's a very warm, wonderful person who is truly making a difference in this world. Dr. Insel, welcome, welcome. To begin with, can you just give a response to the movie, American Tragedy? Oh, Lisa, that is such a wonderful introduction. And it, it is really an honor to be here. I'm delighted to join the other people who have been part of this project, but most of all, to be there for you and, and the others who have made this, I think, really powerful, important film, especially at this time. I, you know, when I first saw it, I, I remember thinking to myself, um, I was blown away by Sue Klebold, and and I just I mean, that was the first thing that really grabbed me, was just how open and brave and and just her integrity, just in every every way. I kept thinking about um, uh, something I had read. It was by uh, Andrew Solomon, who wrote this wonderful book, uh, Far from the Tree, which is probably right behind me on my bookshelf, and he has a section in there where he talks about interviewing uh, Tom and Sue Klebold. And, he, and the book is about interviewing lots of families who are struggling with very difficult, maybe some horrific family situations. And he says in the book, he said, 
having gone through all of this, he said, if I could choose um, any of the families in this book that I'd want to, uh, I'd want to be part of, um, he said, uh, this is the one, this is the one I, you know, these, these are the people I'd be most game to be in their family. And, and I could certainly see that in the way that um, that was presented. The other thing I think about the film for me was the, the sense of hope that you, you really drove this towards this opportunity to say, it doesn't have to be this way. Right. We can do better. We know better. And we know what needs to be done. So it just takes now the will and we have a way to make that happen. And by starting early, by providing kids what they need, providing families what they need, it's no mystery to that. We know what those things are. You've heard about it from some of the other speakers. And so getting to that is going to be really important. Um, I, you know, I prepared some remarks. I'm not going to show any slides, but I'd be happy to sort of talk you through some of the thoughts I have about where we're at and where we need to go, what the new paradigm could look like. Because that, is this a good time to do that? Lisa, how would you like to proceed? Well, we have a little clip that we want to show of Dr. Insult in the movie, American Tragedy. And then I think that would be the perfect thing. Walk us through where you are. This, this keynote address he has entitled Recovery. And he's in the email, he said, we've got to learn how to live. And I just wanted to embrace that. And um, with what Sarah Davidon just said and with this, so let's watch this little clip and then let's go into it. I come at this from is having spent 13 years as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is the federal agency for research on mental illness. And the whole mission of that agency is to improve diagnosis and therapeutics and to reduce the burden of mental illness. I would say that in the 13 years I was there, I spent about $20 billion of taxpayer money to try to deliver on that mission. And I think we failed. One of the ways to think about this is if every seventh grader learned mindfulness and some aspects of, of reframing and cognitive behavior therapy for managing mood, in the same way that they learned soccer and football and basketball, I mean, is that something that we should just build into a fitness campaign? Now, there is an attempt to do this in Australia. They're planning to do this literally with seventh graders at population scale. If you do this for 100,000 seventh graders, what's the long-term impact? All children need to be educated about good mental health practices and how to maintain them throughout life. But this requires a willingness to embrace great social change. I think there's a greater tolerance for this and a greater understanding of the importance of this in some other countries. It's been difficult for us in this country to understand the importance of mental fitness. We're very focused on physical fitness still. That was your introduction. So where are we and where do we need to go? Well, um, I think we're, <laughs> a, we're in a difficult place to be, to be fair. I, um, I think we're all realizing um, in the middle of this pandemic, just what the challenges are. And, and you know, if you look at the headlines, uh, no question, you're talking about, uh, a, we're really in the middle of a kind of American tragedy, right? The crisis of the day is we've got uh, three and a half million cases of COVID and 100, 138,000 deaths as of today. Um, so this is a real public health crisis we're in the middle of. Um, it's, it's different because here we, we know the cause. Uh, we have intense political and scientific and public attention uh, to the problem, um, even though we lack the treatments. Um, and also, you know, it's been largely, not completely, but many of the deaths have been for older people, not for young people. Um, uh, there, there's really probably no confusion, I think, when people look around today and they see the economic upheaval, they see the closing of the schools and and all the social costs, this is related to the pandemic. It's important to recognize that we're in a different sort of crisis on the mental health side. Um, it's, it's a crisis which 
in some ways shares aspects of COVID. Um, it's inescapable. And I think all of us uh, have, have begun to recognize this. You know, there's a wonderful quote that I often use from Susan Sontag about the visitor who entered without knocking. She uses that to talk about cancer. It's very much the way I feel about what we go through um, with mental illness in adolescence where we still don't really understand why some kids can skate through uh, without problems and others fall through the ice. It's just something that um, we need to know more about. On the other hand, um, what we need to recognize is that this is in fact an American tragedy on the scale of what COVID is doing to this country. Ken, Ken Burns is doing a documentary as well on the same topic on youth mental health. Um, and, and I've been working a little bit on that as well. And we're calling it there, the, the crisis that hides in plain sight. Um, as with COVID, enormous consequences, poverty, incarceration, homelessness. Um, and of course, as you see in the film, violence, often self-directed, but even other directed. But the difference in the mental health world, the difference from what we're seeing with COVID is that we don't make the connection. Uh, people somehow don't understand that all of those seemingly untractable social problems are manifestations of the same root root cause, which is untreated mental illness. Uh, and that I think is, is really important for us to get clear about. It's also for me striking because um, in the same way that COVID is due to this emerging pandemic where you've got a new virus that's raging. Um, in fact, the crisis we have with mental health in America, that American tragedy, is not really due to a very high increase in prevalence. There is an increase in uh, the number of people, number of young people with depression that's up about 40, 50%, depending on the study. But, but it's, not, it's not this massive epidemic the way you're seeing with an infectious disease. The American tragedy of mental health, that, that crisis is not due to an epidemic, it's due to a, a crisis of care a crisis of neglect. It's a crisis which is actually not so much about a virus or about what's happening to us. It's about us and our failure to provide care for those who most need it when they most need it. Uh, and that's why this issue of untreated mental illness really needs to be a focus that we begin to understand um, that uh, this is actually what's behind so much of what we're struggling with. Now, you, you know, you know those basic facts. I'm sure everybody's heard them too many times. The, the stats of one in four affected and one, one in 20 have a serious mental illness and 75% of the time it's the illness starts before age 25. And these are, as people have said, the chronic disorders of young people. I mean, you hear all of this a lot and we've sort of all learned to memorize that. But, but I, I wanna focus on three things and I'll do it fairly quickly because I don't wanna take a lot of time here. But the three things that I think we, we haven't talked enough about that are really gonna to have to be key to understanding this particular American tragedy. The first is this, this idea that the crisis is a crisis of care. It's a crisis of neglect that over 50% of people who have a mental disorder, especially of adolescence, where it's about 60% are not getting treatment. Now that is not true in any other part of medicine, um, but it is an inescapable fact here. Some of them are going to social media. Um, some of them are going to peers, but they're not getting professional care that's likely to actually be helpful. The duration of untreated psychosis in the United States is about 77 weeks. That is almost, um, unthinkable. Uh, in the UK, the goal is to have that as less than two weeks. Uh, and indeed, even that is quite a bit. To think that young people could be psychotic for a year and a half before anybody does what's needed to help them uh, is, is really, it's egregious. And it's something that we need 
to be thinking about. So the first point I would make is that we have to get serious. This is not an epidemic. It's, it's a crisis of neglect, a crisis of a failure uh, in the care system. The second point um, that is really important for us to remember is that the consequences can be fatal. And that, that point is made absolutely clearly in the film. Um, in a way, the, the numbers are sort of extraordinary. You know, suicide in this country has increased over 30% in the last 20 years. The biggest increase actually is in youth, a 56% increase in people between the ages of 10 and 24. And that's now the second highest source of mortality in that age, grade, age range. There are um, about 3,000 attempts, uh, suicide attempts every day by adolescents in this country, a 73% increase in suicide attempts by African-Americans, which is really important for us to be thinking about right now. And then this extraordinary number that for LGBTQ kids, adolescents, they run a suicide rate that's about mortality rate, that's about four times higher than other adolescents. So this is really uh, important to recognize the fatal consequences of not having done a better job. It's not just that these are tough problems, but that we are failing increasingly. Um, if you look at the stats over the last two decades. Now, the third point I'd make, and the one that is probably the most important to take away, that we tend to not think about enough, is that all of this is avoidable that every mental illness of young people, every one of these illnesses is treatable uh, and some are preventable. Uh, you can go through the list, anxiety, anorexia, ADHD, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, every one of them, we have either medications or psychotherapies that are effective given in the right dose at the right time to the right person, we can do very well. And that's what makes this so so tragic is that we have treatments that work and yet we're not getting the treatments to people when they need them. There are lots of reasons for that. And, and I don't wanna just point fingers at a bad care system. The fact is um, for people who have depression, they may be too helpless and hopeless to seek treatment. For people who are psychotic, they don't think they're, they're ill. And for young people who are really anxious, they're avoidant and it's really hard for them to get in to get care. But it's really important for us to recognize that the that programs that, as you've been talking about on, with other speakers here, that stress resilience and emotional regulation, and mindfulness and compassion. We just mentioned the program in Australia. There's a wonderful program in the UK called Sure Start that does the same sorts of things. In other countries, they're kind of ahead of the curve here, at least way ahead of us in being able to move upstream and be, I mean, being able to give young people some of the tools to help them cope with this so that they are prepared to seek help when uh, they're overcome. The, the sort of worst manifestation of mental illness usually for most people would be uh, the psychotic illnesses, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, some forms of bipolar disorder. And even there, we have a new comprehensive program called co uh, coordinated specialty care, which given at the right time early on, almost ensures that anybody who has a first episode of psychosis won't have a second episode, a kind of secondary prevention, which is every bit as important as the kind of prevention we've been talking about, primary prevention of moving into schools. So what I'd like to leave you with is this idea that yes, we have a crisis. We have large numbers of kids affected. Very few are in care. There are fatal consequences to not getting care. And yet the real tragedy for me is that we know what to do and we're not doing it. And that is unacceptable. It begs the question, why aren't we doing it? And you know what? What most people will say is we're not doing it because of stigma. Um, I have to say, I really dislike that term. Uh, to me, it's a, it's a victim term. 
I think the reason we do it, we we aren't doing better is is discrimination. It's a it's a civil rights problem. It's a social justice problem. Um, we have 186,000 deaths of despair in the past year, 2019, in this country. 186,000 deaths due to suicide, overdoses, alcohol-related deaths, all due to mental disorders, the lack of mental fitness. That's versus 138,000 deaths from COVID so far. So just to put that number in perspective, it's so great that for the first time last, last year, life expectancy in this country went down for the first time in a century. So what's driving all that to me is this, this kind of discrimination, this social injustice, there's a lack of leadership, and most of all, I have to say, and I think to go back to Miles's comment, I think it's getting better, but we've had a lack of public will about this. That's what's really changing. And what I'm so excited about with this film is it becomes one more part of that whole fleet of changes that's happening, that's bringing the public to this, to this topic, helping people to realize it's safe to talk about this, that all of us, all of us have a story um, that, any of us should feel safe to share. And ultimately the hope is that this will shift the narrative from talking about violence to talking about illness, from talking about problems to talking about solutions. And my, my belief is it ultimately will change us from talking about tragedies to really talking about hope. So I'm delighted uh, to be able to um, celebrate with you the release of the film. I think this is so exciting to uh, have more and more people seeing it, talking about it. This becomes part of the conversation. There's lots of other things happening. Um, the Well Beings Initiative was launched this week as well for youth mental health. Uh, there'll be the uh, documentary by Ken Burns that'll be out sometime next year, the year after, uh, on youth mental health as well. It's going to be really a movement that's starting, and it couldn't come too soon. Uh, and I'm just so delighted, Lisa, that uh, you can play an important role in this and that all of us can help you to succeed. Thanks well, for having me here. As both Sarah and Jose know, I believe I'm one piece of a million piece puzzle. And I'm not more important than any other piece. And nor is Sue Klebold. We are all one piece and we just need to link together and work together to make the picture beautiful and bright and clear and understandable. And we're so grateful to you. And, and I'm, uh, we have a phone number for people who can text in questions. I don't have it. 307-655-6396. But um, I have a question and it has to do a little bit with um, what Sarah Davidon spoke on and what you have addressed is it seems to me the best uh, direction would be universal mental wellness from birth on that we start teaching people, parents, how to parent their children for empathy, how to identify their own emotions, how to um, deal with failure, how to use a growth mindset. And then the preschools and the elementary schools and on up that the focus is every child is going to be taught either in their home or in their school or in their faith communities or in their clubs. There's going to be enough redundancy that every single child will be taught the basic uh, reframing op um, options, the, the idea of, of growth mindset, of how you talk to yourself, of how to challenge the negative thinking. Um, why is this not, what would it take? Let's just, let's just be hopeful today. What, what, what can we do to make that happen? You want me to jump in on that? Yes, Dr. Inso, please. Okay. And then I want Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I did a presentation earlier this week to the National Council of Mayors and on the same topic, we were talking about this and we had uh, the first lady of New York, Shirley McRae, um, a really brilliant young mayor from Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Mayor Labumba and, and myself and we were talking and the same question came up, like what could we do? And, and the three of us, we were given three choices. Uh, they said, well, the most important thing is it reducing stigma, increasing financing, or um, I think uh, the third one was workforce. 
And all three of us said none of the above. We all said what's missing now is leadership. We need political will. We need leadership on this topic. There has not been a national leader for mental health and for fitness, mental fitness, since 1963. That was the last time a president really stood up and said, we're going to make this a priority for my administration because I care about the future of this country. Uh, and that was the beginning of the community mental health movement under JFK. Jimmy Carter tried to reinstate that to some extent, but it collapsed within a year after he left office. Uh, and it's, there's just been very little willingness to focus on this topic, partly because I, I think there's a sense from um, many, many political corners that this is a, it's a local topic. It's not something the federal government should get engaged in. Um, and also nobody wants to spend the money. Um, I also think there's just a, a profound misunderstanding of the importance of this, that people just assume that this happens automatically and that um, kids get what they need from families that um, give it to them because they're all living together. No real understanding that uh, families do need support. And it starts at the very beginning, starts during pregnancy. Um, now, again, there are countries that get this, right? Um, you could go to the UK, go to the Netherlands, go to France. It's not only that they provide um, parental leave, um, in some Scandinavian countries for both moms and dads, but they also provide lots of social support, um, psychoeducation, lots of uh, the kinds of support you were just describing. That's the Sure Start program in, in the UK is what you just described. We know how to do this. We just have not had the political will. And so what I'm arguing for and what I love about this film and this conversation is that the political will only happens if we demand it. We have to get the public will. We have to get a public movement going to really um, force this issue. Um, I think now's the time that we can do it. And I think we have to. I think we are in for a tidal wave if we don't, a tidal wave of more tragedy. Um, Sarah, I'd love to get your input about, you know, what do you, let's be hopeful. What can we do? We, we must have change. Therefore, we must envision it and believe it can happen. For sure, and I, I'm right there with um, with Tom on the the sort of lack of um, systemic and political will. I guess I would also add that um, I mean I think people think about um, you know teaching social emotional skills and mental health and mental wellness and as kind of an add on. Um, they you know I think primarily schools think of it as something that needed needs to be sort of added on to the already sort of very um, um, heavy workload that teachers have, um, I think, in primary care and in the healthcare system, it's considered an add-on. Um, so we need to figure out ways to embed um, social, emotional, and mental health and mental wellness into the systems that serve children and families and and adults and geriatric populations and, and sort of all, you know all of our populations. Where where do they go? Um, and how do we make mental health and mental wellness a part of those systems rather than an add-on that um, is often interpreted as burdensome. I love that. Jose, do you have, Dr. Silva, do you have any input on the same question? Yeah, yeah you know, I, um, I'm just fascinated to hear both of, what both of you all have to say. And so for me, it's, I really look at this piece as I go back to where it says great social change, right? This is that moment. And without political leadership and will, it's become part of us as organizations and in holding spaces to kind of lead that work. And it has made it difficult. But I think that if we start to turn the tide and part of what I've talked about is turning these social issues into a fiscal numerative, because then you're able to attach both camps, right? Those that fight for social causes and then those that are fiscal, that can see themselves as a fiscal responsible, individual, whatever camps they're in, if we start to engage them around how this great social change can impact us at an economic level, I think we can do some of that work at some of the state level. But if we don't have leadership that says, let's, let's, let's talk about mental health and mental wellness, um, we're a long way away. We might be a long way away, but I am an optimist. 
I yes, really, I, I really, and I, you know, one thing that I, I know you can't legislate families. I know that. But I also do not know a single parent that doesn't want to know skills to help a child who's having behavioral issues or doesn't want to know how to direct a child who who uh, is feeling bad about themselves. I mean, I have eight grandkids and um, four children who and in-laws who are parents and they want to know we have a generation that we don't have to wait for the a new political directive. I'd love to have a political leader, but we do not have to wait. We have got to say, yes, you can, and write books like Dr. Insel is doing, and do policies like Sarah Davidon is doing, and um, oversee uh, organizations for infant mental health like Dr. Silva is doing. I mean, I think the conversation, if we say, we have to have a political leader, then we do not, we have no control of when it will happen. I agree with you. I, I, I guess what my piece was is that's why we do it as a state, local, municipal levels. It would be important because of the funding structure and those components and those pieces. I think Dr. Insel, when he talks about spending $20 billion um, and, and the takeaway on that, having that good structure helps support us. But I'm ready to, to be on uh, Governor Polis' doorstep tomorrow because I think he knows that this is next on his list for us to, to make way. Yes. And I do think our governor is aware of 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 the need for a better mental well yes. culture but there's a lot going against mental wellness dr yes. insel you are the uh, california mental health czar yes. <laughs> that name just always <laughs> is a unique <laughs> name to me tell me what your vision is for california and how can that go beyond that state yeah. well so so we have a I'm a little biased. We have a really extraordinary leader here. <clears throat> and I, I only wish that he could move to Washington. Uh, it can't be soon enough because I, I do think he gets this. He understands it. Um, he struggled with dyslexia when he was a kid um, and really struggled. And so he kind of knows it in a, in a visceral way, what it's, what it's like to grow up different and how hard that can be. Um, also grew up in a single parent family. It's just a bunch of challenges that he overcame. Um, and he went on to become mayor of San Francisco and then Lieutenant governor, now governor. Um, when he took office, uh, he called me in to say, you know, as mayor, he, he faced uh, homelessness and crowding in the jails and um, huge problems around uh, certain kinds of crime. And it took him a long time to understand that all those were due to the same root cause and he never knew it and he never did anything about it. So he said, I'm not gonna make that mistake again as governor, I wanna really get focused on this. So I agreed to join him at least for several months, and kind of travel around the state, understand what was working, what wasn't, give him a proposal and a kind of a blueprint for what to do. And we ended up really talking about two or three things. One is trying to certainly to integrate care, which is a very fragmented system here Another was to lay out some very specific outcomes that we were gonna fight for. Um, and those could be reducing suicide, making sure that every kid with a serious mental illness would graduate from high school, which is a huge problem. Uh, and making sure that any kid that has a first episode of psychosis never has a second one. So we had a bunch of things like that. And also we were trying to, it was maybe the most ac acute problem is move mental health care out of the criminal justice system so that people with serious mental illness are in the healthcare system, not in our jails. Just, just, I mean, again, no other country does that. Uh, so, uh, and we never used to do it. So we know, we know how to fix that. Um, the other thing that we talked a lot about was understanding how to move upstream. And this is something that I think in California, there's a, there's a real movement to do that. Some of that involves the school system. Some of it involves family support. A lot of it, which we haven't talked about so much here, is giving kids a chance to help themselves. So, and we are now, I mean, if, if you ask me what's the biggest change that I've seen in the last decade, it's probably that, that this generation, meaning the kids who are now in high school or just in the early phases of college are much more open about these issues. They are pushing the adults to begin to have this conversation. They are engaging with each other. So I, I run a, a company called Nest Health, which is works with TikTok. And we're, you know, we have many, many uh, therapists on TikTok and Instagram. And it's 
that's where this is happening. Kids are out there relating to each other, bringing this stuff into the, into the forefront. Um, and they have a much higher tolerance for talking about it than even the generation X and Y. So it's pretty, pretty interesting to see. I'm hopeful that those kinds of things that we can move upstream, empowering kids and empowering families, thinking about how to use schools in a way. And, and I agree with Sarah. I mean, there's like a huge resistance. Schools do not want to get into this because they already are overwhelmed with responsibilities. So we have to make it easy for them. And we have to do it in a way that really serves their needs. But how do you do that if, um, like here, the schools are probably going to be all remote in this next year? It's, you know, we are in a really complicated moment. Um, it's going to make it super easy to change some things like now we can do telehealth instead of having everything in brick and mortar for, for therapy. That's great. And it's been fantastic to see that change happen so quickly, but it's going to be really hard to do some other things like, you know, making house calls and being in, you know, being there with, uh, with new families to help them in a, not in a remote way, but actually being in the home, that's going to be tough. And, and being in schools is going to be tough because the kids aren't going to be in school, at least not in the state of California. So uh, this is a really interesting time where it's going to be easier to make some changes, harder to make others. And we're going to have to navigate through that in the next six months, probably. Sarah, if you could identify what gives you the greatest hope right now in this very complex crazy world that we live in, um, and all the problems, where's the hope? Um, you know, I think Tom said something really important, which is we have, you know, youth and young adults today who are very active and very open and very invested. Um, so I have a lot of hope. Um, I mean, I have two 12 year olds. Um, I have hope that um, they and their peers and, and, you know, around the nation, kids who are, you know, young, young adults and adolescents are, um, they're understanding the, the, um, the need for not only addressing mental health issues, but also, um, I'm sorry about the dogs barking in the background. No worries. Um, not only addressing um, mental illness and mental health and me distress, um, but of supporting mental wellness. Um, I mean, I've, I've talked to a number of youth groups and um, you know, had some pretty you know, good engaging conversations with youth who um, are so open about not only talking about it, but being change agents for um, a, a healthier mental health care system. And Jose, what gives you the most hope? You know, I'm, I'm an optimistic, hopeful person I, through all my experiences that I've engaged in. And partly for me is that it's being talked about. Tom talked about our young people are speaking about it. But more importantly, I'm thinking about the, the young men of color, 25 to 35, that are now navigating, have maybe survived this piece of inner city trauma and violence and now we're trying to find their way into manhood, adulthood and marriage or whatever that might be. And they're now going and taking care of themselves. And we call it the tune-up campaign. And so all the young men I mentor, I have, have them in counseling, I'm in counseling. We, we talk about it openly, we discuss it openly and, and we are removing that stigma as men of color. And so that gives me hope because then if men of color are doing the work, then that means they're in turn making sure that work is happening in their family and they're going to bring those lessons back to the way they raise their children. And then their children are going to raise their children the way that they, and we're looking at ending that generational cycle. And so it gives me hope to see um, so many men engaging in this conversation of doing their own internal work to be better fathers and better men. I love that idea of the men taking, I mean, in American tragedy, I think one of the greatest weakness of it is lack of, of dads. And the reality is Tom Tindall would not talk. Lori Freeman's husband died by suicide after his son died by suicide. And uh, Lisa Neeson's husband died by suicide. Uh -huh. um, so there were no dads. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I, I'm thrilled when I hear uh, what you just said, Jose, that the, the men are saying, I need to take this baton. This, I'm part of this relay. This is not about the others. This is about me. Um, and I think what gives me the greatest hope 
is that just what you said, Dr. Insel, we know skills that can help us. We understand the brain well enough to know that we must have good relationships. We must teach people how to have good relationships. We know how to reframe. We know that helps with anxiety. We know how exposure therapy, how to go towards something. We can educatedly help parents, help teachers, help preachers and reverends and rabbis. And um, I'm on Iman's go towards these, this idea of teaching mental wellness skills. And if we did that, if everybody said, this is my job, no matter where I am at, this is up to me, then we wouldn't have to wait for a political leader. We would be starting the movement now. And I think that, that I was just going to say, that is this conversation. Tom, we'd love to hear what your thoughts to that. Oh, I just was going to say, I want to bottle what Lisa was just saying. I think that's yes. exactly it. I mean, it does take that kind of drive and optimism. And I agree with you. I think we don't have to wait for someone to do that for us any more than Black Lives Matter is going to wait for another African-American president. That's not going to happen, right. <laughs> at least not in the near term. So, so uh, we've got to take this on. I do think it's happening. I mean, it is. I've been in this for how long? Almost what, almost five decades. And uh, there's never been a moment like this. I mean, this is really the time when there's more activity, whether it's in the tech sector where I live or in the entertainment industry, in the film sector, like what, we, what we're looking at here, or even in, um, in the education sector, in the political sector, where it's not happening at the national level, but in several states and several counties, this is becoming an issue that people really care about. And most of all, it's happening I mean, in families. You know, the kids That's are taking this on. The next generation is going to be better. They are going to do this better. And my um, that should give us all enormous hope. Oh, yeah. And my daughter-in-law, I mean, I have five sons and they, their wives parrot for mental wellness. I see them and they and my sons parent for mental wellness. I watch them parent in a better way than I ever did. I parented with love, but I didn't parent with mental wellness skills. And I, I do grandparent now with mental wellness skills. And I see it in this generation. And to me, it's, it's going to, if we can get beyond social media and superficial um, connections, we have a good future. We have where we can make a movie about American triumph not American tragedy. Oh, I love that title. We have a viewer question. And so I'd want to just love to pose this viewer question. And it's some of the, some of the thoughts that I have. But um, I found that treatment exists, right? We know that it's there. But for this particular person, they say it's just not accessible to those without deep pockets. How can we change this? What are your thoughts around that? And we'll start with uh, Tom and then Sarah. We'd love to have, Sarah, let's start with you, Sarah. Let's start with you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the cost of the cost of healthcare is still a problem, even as um, you know, the uh, incentives and changes that have been made to the healthcare system in you know the past years, it's still cost prohibitive. Um, you know, I think um, we have uh, mental health parity laws in place, but I think one of the major issues is that they're not being fully implemented. Um, you know, we have a, a so mental health parity is um, in essence um, that mental health care um, needs to be covered in terms of you know not limiting visits and um, you know accessible uh, practitioners um, in the same way that physical health care is covered. Um, but but in all honesty, I don't know a single state who um, is actually implementing mental health parity well. Um, because the part of that is also that you can't charge higher co-pays for mental health care than for physical health care. You can't, um, you know, there, there can't be sort of these like drastic rate differentials. Um, one of the key problems I think is in addition to the cost of care to a person receiving services is the reimbursement rates from our healthcare systems. Um, you know, I think this happens in, in Medicaid as well as, you know, sometimes in um, the commercial insurance as well, is that um, mental health care providers are not reimbursed um, for their services adequately. 
And so that then um, trickles down. So if we have a system where mental health professionals are not um, being reimbursed for their services on par with the physical health care system, that's problematic. And the, fund, the foundation to me is that whenever I go to a doctor for medical needs, I'm it with him for maybe 10, 15 minutes at the most. But when I go to therapy or when my daughter would, or my child would go to therapy, that's 50 minutes of the, of the of practitioner's time. And, and so the difference of how much is expected time-wise is pretty drastic. So good. Dr. Insel. Well, I agree, Sarah. I mean, a lot of this is um, just the injustice that there's really two different systems here. It's also true that uh, a lot of mental health practitioners don't accept insurance, partly because the reimbursement rates are so low. Uh, and that, that really means that we have a terrible workforce shortage uh, in the commercial market. Uh, it's a funny thing, and I don't think this is true in any other area of healthcare, but often you can get better care uh, or get more rapid care in the public market than in the private market when it's mental health care. It's a sort of bizarre joke that I, you know, I consult with a lot of very, very wealthy people who will have a kid who needs psychiatric care. And I frequently we tell them, I, you know, it's, it's too bad you're a billionaire because if you were on Medicaid in this state is called Medi-Cal, um, you'd be able to get care much more quickly and probably better care than you're able to get because there's just no one available uh, who has, has the time to see your son or daughter. So it's, um, it, it, but even the public system isn't great. It needs to be much, much better. But uh, this, you know, there is this whole, it's time I think to rethink, we have a very broken mental health care system. Um, uh, when I was in government at the very beginning, uh, after one of the school shootings, actually, one of the, uh, we had a press conference and Rich Carmona was Surgeon General then, uh, now pretty well known in Arizona because uh, he's run for governor and senator a couple of times. And, and he was asked what he was going to do to fix the mental health care system. And he said nothing. And there was like this hushed silence amongst the reporters. Nobody could quite believe he said it. He said, I don't think we have a mental health care system to fix. It's, there's nothing there. I mean, it's just so fragmented. It's so broken. Or we have so many systems, it's hard to identify which one really works. Um, and, and I think that's probably even as true today as it was then, which was about 2005. You know, things are really not, have not gotten much better over time. They, if anything, they've gotten worse uh, with less funding, less uh, support on both the private and the public side. Commercially, it's under 5% of medical care on the commercial side is for mental health. Um, so it's, you know, it's way, way underfunded. And I have no idea what the answer to that is. I mean, that's a sad thing is that it's underfunded and how do we change it? Um, yeah. So we, you know, I've got some ideas about that. I mean, one of the things you. I really believe in um, is that we can do better with new systems of care. And so part of what we're thinking a lot about these days is, what could a, a, a completely transformed mental health care system look like? And, and maybe that's not going to come from the government. So, you know, I happen to believe in the private sector as where really the best innovation and the best sustainable changes will come from. So I'm putting a lot of my time into building companies that are creating different models that just work better, give you better outcomes at lower cost. It's not that hard to do. You know, we done at MindStrong, we did this for, people with serious mental illness at Nest Health, we're trying to do it for people with more young people with more mild to moderate issues, where we just bring them together with peer support, build community, allow them to help each other, give them the skills they need to take care of each other. That's not expensive and um, it works. So we can do so much better than the current system, which is all based on not managing care, but managing costs. This isn't the way to do this. So I'm very hopeful. Um, and so technology will help us. Yes, it is. And you that's where your work, that is powerful work that you're doing. Sarah, anything you want to say to end? Um, you know, I, I just, I would want to reinforce that our, um, our system right now is a system built on illness. Um, and to really have an adequate mental health care system we need um, a system that addresses the um, kind of promotion, prevention, as well as intervention and recovery. 
um, and really sort of ha has to cover all of those. Otherwise we're gonna have, continue to have an extremely overwhelmed system that um, is sort of addressing those who come into crisis or you know, perhaps could have been, um, their issues could have been addressed earlier on so that it's not quite as overwhelming or not quite as much of a crisis situation. So until we have a system that is really a continuum of care, um, and as I said before, sort of a multi-continua of care so that addressing mental health as well as mental illness is two different continua, um, we're, we're, we're gonna um, uh, continue to have um, kind of systemic challenges to serve the populations in need. Jose, what would you like to end with? I think that this is important to speak up and we're finally telling the stories and the silence is no more. And I think that is a great first step for individuals to be able to embark on their own journey and to share their own journey um, will get us there. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that the, we are now having the conversations, the conversations are being had um, where we did it before. And so we're removing the stigma, we're working that way. Um, I seek to hope to, to create equity in the space of mental wellness and in mental health. I believe we have a long way to come in equity. But I think that we're, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because of the community that I'm around. And so um, I, I, I believe that we are headed in the right direction, but one, one child loss is too many. And so every day the fight remains. Thank you. And I, I, I love that we don't want to feel that we're victims. We want to be victors, like Crystal said last night. Yep. And, um, and we want to believe in the future and that there is hope. And Dr. Inzo, I'm going to give you the chance to end however you want with hope um, that we can. I mean, that my, my commitment is I'm not stopping here. We're going to keep working. We're going to do what we can in our own little domain, as small as it might be, to make a difference in the people we love and the people we don't know but are in part of our lives. We are going to keep working. So, Dr. Inzo, please finish this discussion series however you would like. Well, I wish we could clone you. That's, the, that's my greatest hope because I think that is really the answer. We need people who are willing to lead and to charge on this issue and to wake everybody up and to say, we can do this, we can do this. It is to me like a civil rights problem. It does require a social movement and it's maybe slow to start. Civil rights was that way. It took a lot of decades to really get the momentum. Uh, but I, I think to coin a phrase, we can overcome. I think there is an opportunity to do that. I, I loved what Sarah said about focusing on recovery and then focusing on early stage prevention, preemption, building resilience, thinking about how to do this at a population scale. Um, there's no mystery to this. We know how to do it. It's up to us to make it happen. And I, I, I love Jose's comments. I think this is right, you know, getting getting people to speak their minds, building community, creating a safe place for this to happen. Um, this, is gonna, this is gonna happen, it's gonna happen, but it, it does take films like this to start that conversation, to keep the conversation going. And it's just so vital to remember that it's, you know, there is an American triumph that comes after the American tragedy. It is unfortunate that we have to go through this but we don't have to stop with the tragedy. We don't have to live there. There is so much opportunity to have a better outcome. And um, I have grandchildren as well. So I think just like you do, Lisa, it's like, you know, I'm, this is all about them wanting to make sure that when they have their children, things are gonna be significantly different. And I have to say, I am very hopeful that that will be the case. I'm not sure I would have said that a decade ago but I think we're now at a point where there's enough awareness. And unfortunately, there's been a, so much tragedy that people are now willing to say, we need a better way. And so um, I'm hopeful that this film will be part of that solution. I'd like to think about it as a sort of massive fleet that's going out there. This could be one of the flagships that says, we're gonna do this. Thank you. And to all the 
the viewers, thank you for coming. And we'd sure love to have you subscribe to our YouTube American Tragedy Movie, simply because we want to keep you informed on what we are doing to continue the messaging and continue the hope that we can change the American tragedy into an American victory and triumph. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.